Ariana Stasinopoulos. With her guest, Sir Lawrence Vanderpost, from the heart. Because death is not the end. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's a preparation for that. I, I didn't, but I do believe profoundly that one's life is seasonal. And that the whole of the universe is seasonal. And that there are these seasons that one lives one's way through. But I don't have a feeling at all that the end is the end. Mm -hmm. And that birth was, I don't feel that really birth was my beginning. Birth was merely a door, an entrance, and death is an exit. But I think uh, uh, that as one experiences things, there's a sense of timelessness, of something which is beyond the end and beginning. This I feel, mm -hmm. feel very strongly. I don't feel that, 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 this is, that it's an end. It also is a preparation, that this is a preparation. I've never met Sir Lawrence van der Post, but having spent days immersed in his books, I feel somehow as though I know him. He's arriving tomorrow, and we're going to film our talk here in my apartment. Lawrence van der Post is that rare combination, a distinguished man of action, who's at the same time a poet, a novelist, and a man of vision. As a soldier, he fought behind enemy lines, and by his example, led and inspired thousands of men through the horror of three and a half years in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. As a writer, his books have sold millions of copies around the world. But I don't want to talk to him about his books. I want to ask him about his own life, about the beliefs and feelings that have guided him, and about this critical time that we live in. When I went to the library to get all his books, I thought there must be lots of Lawrence van der Posts. There was a Lawrence van der Post in the fiction section, a Lawrence van der Post in the war section, in the travel section, in the philosophy section, in the psychology section, in the biography section, and even a Lawrence van der Post in the cookery section. His books, especially the ones on philosophy and psychology, have had a great influence on my own writing. He made this film 25 years ago. It's the story of his search in the Kalahari Desert for the legendary Bushmen, the most primitive people on Earth. It really struck a chord when it was first shown. In fact, it was the most widely watched program of its day in England. Personally, I feel that I could very easily spend the rest of my life without watching another film on tribes and jungles. But this one is so different. Through his understanding of the ancient myths and customs of the Bushmen, Lawrence van der Post tells us how he rediscovered his own intuitive wisdom. He keeps stressing how in our time we have suppressed this intuitive side of ourselves with disastrous results. 
Certainly my own life used to be so dominated by my head that I would hardly make a move without good logical reasons. In fact, I would hardly allow myself to feel anything unless my mind provided me with a reason. I want to talk to him about this. How can we learn to listen to our intuition, to trust our inner wisdom, and to make them once again part of our relentlessly rational lives? This film that he made about his close friend, Carl Jung, who together with Freud founded modern psychology, was a true labor of love. An explorer of a world where the mind has mountains, cliffs of fall, frightful sheer, no man fathomed. His name was Carl Gustav Jung. It's really both about Jung and about his own exploration of the world of dreams and intuition. Coincidences don't exist for Lawrence van der Post. Everything that happens to us is part of a pattern and it has its own purpose and meaning. He sees the hidden meaning in so many ordinary everyday events. He really has a unique way of looking at everything and everybody. So when you meet someone new, how do you see them? Do you see them in a different way than most people would look at them? I mean, do you bring that sense of wonder and mystery with you when you look at them? Well, I, um, I, don't, I don't, don't really know I, uh, how, except that when I do meet people, I can only say I don't find, I've never met a so-called normal person. <laughs> uh, you know, this to me is an abstraction. I've never, this is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, when people talk about normality, they're talking statistics. It doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, it always reminds me of a wonderful story of O. Henry, I wonder if you know it, who was uh, who told uh, this great, great American short story yes. writer. He once wrote a story, I think it was called A Typical Man About Town. It was a man who always read the expression um, in newspapers, oh, about so-and-so being a typical man out of town, uh, about town. He thought he would go out and see what it was like, <laughs> and he went everywhere looking for a typical man about town. He couldn't find one towards the end of the day. He was run down and knocked unconscious. And he came to in hospital. And um, he was slightly uh, sort of in a state of amnesia. And anyway, they brought, he was brought a newspaper and he re read a description of his own accident. And in the newspaper report, it said that we don't know the name an identity of the man as yet, but he appeared to be a typical <laughs> man about town. And that's what, uh, I think that's what the, what the individual's life, we're all, we discovered this when an accident knocked us down, mm. that it's us, that it's we. But there is no such thing, really. And yet, that uniqueness that you are talking about is, goes hand in hand with our sense of common humanity. I mean, I find yes. that it's really almost two different things that we have to keep in our minds and in our hearts at the same time. Uh, my mother has been a tremendous lesson for me in that respect because she is the most infuriating person to go shopping with. She finds it incapable to have a mechanical relationship with anyone, you know, whether it's a shop assistant or a taxi driver. She has to establish some kind of connection. It's what you're saying about to recognize their uniqueness and at the same time to recognize that common bond 
And although at first I used to be very irritated because any kind of transaction <laughs> would take much longer <laughs> than it would normally, it taught me a lot about how we can bring that in our everyday life. I mean, it's not, we're not talking theory and philosophy. We are talking about something very practical. Indeed. Tremendously practical and of tremendous, tremendous everyday importance that. And I think one only has that when one has made friends with the humanity in oneself. Then one realizes the importance of the humanity in others. You know, there's a very... In Africa, the Af uh, an African community I grew with, grew up with, there's a very important greeting, the way they have of greeting one another. When they see, a str no, no matter whom they see, they raise their hands and they say, I see you. Mm. And the other person answers, yes, I see you too. And it's almost in that seeing, they stating symbolically that they recognize the humanity of the person, mm. the other. And if you think, in our great cities of the world, it always amazes me where you get people thrown together, how they go by without ever looking at one another. They never see one another. And this is the thing that we have, what we have to bring back, is seeing one another again. And that really is freedom. That really is humanity. How can we begin to see others and ourselves as we really are? Let us take something very simple, which everybody experiences all the time. Everybody dreams. But do they listen to their dreams? Do they take it seriously? Right, uh, no matter how far one goes back, whether you go back to one of the, uh, perhaps the oldest living race that I know, who are still the Stone Age people who don't know civilization, what white people are, this dream language was taken extremely seriously. People listened in to their dreams, and they tried to find out what the dreams are saying, because the dreams report continuously on one on what is inadequate in one's response to life and on what is to come, on the way one has to go. And this dream, though, although, I mean, because of modern psychoanalysis and modern psychology, a lot of people are talking about dreams, or at least paying lip service to the value of dreams. But there's that tremendous fear somehow that dreams uh, can only be interpreted by professional analysts, so that unless one is actually undergoing analysis, it's hardly necessary or important to remember one's dreams or to pay any kind of attention to one's dreams, because one cannot have any key to unlock the meaning of the dreams without the help of a professional analyst. Do you believe that? Uh, uh, no, not necessarily. I think they help enormously, merely in order to teach one the language again, mm -hmm. so one can read the language. But it isn't necessary. I can, uh, uh, I sp uh, knew, perhaps, the, uh, the greatest interpreter of dreams we've had, the man who took them seriously, which was Jung. And um, I'm not a psychologist. I've never done an analysis. I know very little about psychiatry, but I knew Jung as a friend because I loved him and I thought he was a very great person. And I remember saying to him at the time, because I was so impressed, I thought, well, life is so desperate a business that any way one can do to increase one's own armament. I asked him, I said, I wonder if you would allow me to do an analysis with you. And he looked quite upset and he said to me, but has your, you've got your own way. You're a writer and an artist. Has your way failed you? I said, no, I, I don't think it's failed it. He says, well, when you feel it's failed you, we might think about it again, but you get on with your way. So you see, he didn't have that view. I, I certainly believe that. I've been writing down my dreams for five years. Oh, how and, lovely. And gradually they, they began to have a special meaning for me. And sometimes I feel as though a different director is directing them. You mm. know, they switch. Um, texture and they become very different at different periods in my life and I feel much more comfortable with them now because I've spent so much time um, writing them down and uh, 
not necessarily trying to analyze them, but just allowing whatever meaning is there to come up for me to see. I mean, I think that's very important, because if we approach them mm -hmm. mentally and trying to kind of extract the meaning, um, that can be almost dangerous, because that's not very often the logical meaning that we'll go for. No, I, I think it's very, very profound what you're saying. I think the meaning that you can find in your own dreams is infinitely more important than somebody else can find them in for you. I mean, uh, uh, this is one of the cardinal things uh, but people forget now. It was that you always uh, treated the dream in somebody else as their most important private and personal possession. He didn't like to, t he was very careful not to take it away from them. And he treated it with infinite respect. And I think it's rather like that, for instance, uh, I loved playing the piano. I never played it terribly well. Mm -hmm. But somehow, playing the piano badly, even badly as I did, did far more for me, I regret to say, than in a sense listening to somebody else yes. playing the piano for me. And it's the same with dreams. The and music you can make out of it for yourself is far more important than somebody else can. And it's interesting when you talk about playing the piano and the effect that has almost on silencing the mind so that other things can come up. I find it fascinating to see how many people are taking up one form or another of a piano playing equivalent, whether mm. it's gardening or embroidery. I, I think it's, a, it's a, a, a very important thing, a very important way of achieving proportion and balance. And... Um, uh, uh, enabling a part of oneself to live and join in one's life, mm -hmm. which is denied by the specialized functions we are all uh, called upon to do for the community, as being our private, personal selves, which we can do by doing these non-rational things, growing things, for instance, growing flowers. I always think the bravest, I'm terribly moved in cities, where I see a house with a window box outside and flowers growing in. I said, that's all right. There's a flag flying for nature there. <laughs> and it's frightfully important. Or I see a lawn. For instance, the lawns that the British have made all over the world in deserts and in India, in the Sudan, in the Kalahari, where the English went, they made lawns. This little patch, they grew grass in almost a Walt, Win Walt Whitman sense. It's always, I thought, well, this is a flag of creation flying there. For me, another great flag of creation, to use your expression, is coincidence. Everything important that's happened in my life has been by coincidence. You know, the fact that I'm a writer was coincidence. The particular books I write <laughs> are coincidence. How do you explain this phenomena? You can hardly meet a human being who, who won't start off by saying, you know, I've had a funny, funny coincidence the other day. They treat it almost as an accident. But if they could see that this is not an accident, that this is uh, the way of the universe of saying, you know, mm -hmm. I'm taking you in, in keeping. And it's extraordinary to me that, uh, um, that I think that coincidence is a manifestation or what we call chance, of the law of chance, which is not accidental, but which is an overriding law of the universe, a manifestation of the extent to which we belong. And if people would accept it, they would rediscover the sense of belonging, which is one of the great maiming, paralyzing, negation feelings which is mm -hmm. imposed upon us because we've lost this feeling of belonging. Uh, I'm often uh, asked, uh, uh, you know, uh, really what is the difference between uh, primitive man and man as we know it in our modern context. And uh, it always comes down to one thing, is that these people I knew who looked so poor and impoverished and imperiled in the great desert were rich in a way in which we are poor. They were rich because wherever they went, they felt known. They felt they belonged. 
But we, in this society, we have lost this feeling of being known. We feel that we're no longer recognized for what we are in ourselves, and we no longer belong. And this coincidence mm -hmm. helps us to give us a bridge to a re-belonging. It's tremendously liberating also. I find mm -hmm. among friends of mine, as well as from my own experience, how it helps take, r taking risks. You know, the fear of failing, which is such a major fear in, in most people's lives, just disappears because taking risks becomes part of being alive and listening to that voice that you talked about so beautifully very often does involve taking risks because we don't have any clear logical reasons why we are following that course of action or whether it will work or not. And th that attitude of risk taking seems to always have been part of your life. I mean, you've never been afraid to take risks. Did you see them as risks or you didn't even see them as risks um, perhaps? Uh, uh, no, no I, I didn't see them as risks at the time but uh, don't you think it's very interesting uh, how what I call living intuitively is coming back. The sense of intuition is mm -hmm. coming back to modern man. And this happens, and it's happened throughout history, when cultures and societies are up against a dead end, and they do not see the way out. The way ahead is blind. Mm -hmm. They find themselves, they don't know what to do. And then suddenly intuition becomes important. Because intuition is that in us which is aware of things that are not yet visible, things that are around the corner of time. And the moment you follow, start following in intuition, then the coincidence has come to confirm whether you, your intuition is on the right track or not. And I find that this is coming alive in people and it gives me great hope because people are becoming more and more intuitive. You see it in all sorts. At the moment it tends to be group phenomenon, but in isolation people are, are seeking, even in the way in which they uh, try to see into life beyond the grave and into the future. People are interested far more in the unknown again than in the known, which is a tremendously positive, life-giving element. And I think out of which the renewal of our societies is going to come. It's not going to come out of the known, because the known we know only too well. You seem to have such a strong sense of us being in transition, as though there is an evolutionary turning point that's taking place. Is that accurate? Do you feel that? No, I feel that very strongly. I think we're living since uh, the last war. I think there's been an extraordinary shift in, in human psychology. And I think uh, uh, that um, we are engaged in an enormous act of preparation. And that this conflict, which is, which is upon us between the individual and the collective, that this is the sort of dying spasm of history which is going to be discarded. And I think there's something new emerging. Because it always comes back to this, I think, more and more, that we cannot take the life of our time further than we've taken ourselves. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who, who think uh, uh, the Western world has become a great area for exhorting people all the time to be things intellectually without having an experience, without knowing what they mean. But we have to discover the meaning of freedom in ourselves, or being free. And the only way of being free is in the truth. Um, there is a tremendous statement. I think if you get it in Dante, you're also getting it in Jung. Uh, when they discover the importance of love, the overall importance, that love ultimately is the overriding law of the universe. That however oh, hateful, however exacting a life is, that there is an overall sense of direction which we call love. And that this love imposes upon human beings the obligation, gives them the freedom to choose between truth 
and error. And this is real freedom, is to choose between truth and error and make one stand in truth. And we've got to discover this in ourselves before we can bring it back into societies. Because what we call freedom is a kind of, a kind of self-indulgence license at the moment. It's not real freedom. But when you talk about love, again, that's another <laughs> word mm. that um, is in it's urgent so debased, need isn't yes, it? Yes. Of, of redefining. But does it, what does it mean to you practically? What does it mean to you in terms of your own everyday life? Uh, what love means yes. to me? Well, it isn't uh, two people kissing against the sunset because the mortgage on their house has been <laughs> redeemed. You know how films used to end. It's not a sentimental concept. I think it is a call to battle. Mm -hmm. It's the most heroic concept there is. When you are called upon to go into battle with love, out of love, you're really fighting the real battle of life. As to um, live uh, with a sense of wholeness, which is love. With this a sense of not being sidetracked into hatred by the imperfections of a given moment, mm -hmm. but seeing the imperfections as the raw material seeing our problems, loving our problems, because they are the raw material of redemption and salvation. And this is why this, this time is so marvelous, because it's so full of problems. This is really, we've got so much to redeem and work on, so that our life can't be without meaning. And this is what, well, well, for me, this is what love is. It's a call to redeem in wholeness, to to be on the side of the totality of life in the universe and not to be sidetracked, not to be embittered by the shadow, by the suffering and so on. So the call to battle, this is really the battle for meaning. It's a battle for meaning, yes. And the realization that there's something uh, which is far more important in life, far more important than personal happiness or unhappiness, and that is the discovery of meaning. Mm -hmm. Once you feel that your life has meaning, there's nothing that you can't endure. The one thing that the human spirit cannot endure, and this is what is absolutely our enemy in the moment, is this feeling that there's no meaning in everything. This feeling of meaninglessness. People don't find it in their work. They don't find it in their personal lives. It's because it's been, ta it's been taken away from them. But the thing that is remarkable about your life is that when you choose truth, you don't judge the error. Um, let me be more specific. When you spent three and a half years in a prison camp in Java, um, the thing that overwhelmed me when I was reading about your experience was the fact that although you could very clearly see the truth from the error, you did not judge the error. You did not judge the Japanese. You seemed to be able to forgive them, which seemed to me really superhuman almost. Well, um it wasn't a conscious act of forgiveness because the extraordinary thing was, although one was imprisoned by the Japanese and I had a long period of war before I came into prison with the Japanese, but when I came, in, I, I had been to Japan, I knew them, it was an extraordinary way in which we felt sorry for the Japanese. So that in a way we always, I, we all got to the point where we felt extremely sorry for them, because in a funny kind of way, they seemed to be the prisoners, and we seemed to be the free people. They were caught up in a trap of history of their own. They were the victims of what they were doing to us. But it's one thing for us to talk about it now, and, and I can see logically mm. what you mean by them being really the prisoners, but when you're being beaten up by them, a lot of people being killed by them, um, starved by them. It's much more difficult to maintain that philosophical position, isn't it? Well, it was, a, it was just extraordinary but, but in the way in, uh, in which one suddenly realized, uh, for instance, that when uh, Christ said, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do, he wasn't just making uh, what you might call uh, a statement of sentiment, of religious sentiment, 
or conscious religious principle. He was stating a scientific truth. Because if you realize that people are doing things and they don't know what they are doing, somehow uh, an enormous feeling of compassion comes over you and you're free, you liberate it yourself. And uh, to me, uh, from the word, the moment I walked into prison, in a way it was a disaster on one level, but I also felt it was an enormous opportunity if we came through alive, this period uh, could be the raw material of a renewal of ourselves, an enlargement of ourselves, and that we could make ourselves free in a way that we hadn't been free before, because we were completely in the power of other men. Our lives, mm -hmm. everything was in the power of other men, and we only had as a force, as something to help us, this ancient voice calling through the mythological thing in us. And that's really what saw us through, is by we were, had no possessions, uh, we had no certainty, we had no security. Our lives were not our own. Our lives were in the hands of whatever was in charge of life, and which spoke through this ancient calling, calling one night and day, and reminding one of how all this had happened before, and that there was an answer built into life for these situations. And if we lived into it, we would come out free. And that's what happened. One didn't consciously set about forgiving the Japanese, but, but I just living it truthfully, living it truthfully, we came out free of the experience. The experience in fact, I meet people now who were in prison with me and almost longed to be back because they said those were the days. They discovered a freedom of it, a freedom from possessions, a freedom from the materialism of our time, and which from imprisons the triviality. us. From all the trivialities. We were living on a margin of life and death which could come and where only the truth matter. And it's a, it was an enrichment which has never left one. For instance, when Solzhenitsyn speaks in his books, yes. Why he, uh, and in that great voice, he, he speaks to me. It's because I realized the voice comes from someone who has lived on this margin, mm -hmm. where you don't know from day to day whether you'll be alive or not, and where the only thing that sets you free is the truth. Solzhenitsyn has obviously had a very profound influence in your life, but I remember reading in one of your books that of all the great men you have met, Carl Jung was the greatest. I was one of the people who really wouldn't take an interest in Jung and it really started through my wife. I went to see her when I came back and she'd gone. As I said, she started to do while I was away doing things and she'd gone to work with Jung in Surrey. And I met him and, and we became friends. And then I became immensely interested in the work that he was doing. And his whole work, as he told me, he said, I found that in every case of derangement, in alienation in the human personality, it's because people had been deprived of their personal story. Mm -hmm. The feeling that they mattered as individuals, and that the whole task of healing was to bring, to restore their story to them, which he did through working on their dreams and so on. And that he found that by doing this, he said, to me, I never accomplished what people call a cure, but without enabling people to rediscover their capacity for religious experience. There was no ordinary people for him. Every human being was extraordinary. Mm. How differently do you feel about these things now? You are 75, which is very hard to believe. Um, Am yeah. I? <laughs> That's what the statistics say, but maybe they are wrong. They often are. But do you find that all these things become more meaningful, that all your realizations and everything you've lived by um, becomes even more intensely real now, or has it always been as real? No, I, 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 I don't know, but, it, uh, do, but don't you find... I, 
I feel that everything I've tried to do, really, has been a discovery of something that I was at the beginning, mm -hmm. something which I was potentially, and that the, I have in me the most severe critic. I have an image of myself uh, which sort of stands over me and which I refer to, which I think is me as I was sometime around about the age of four or five which doesn't change and doesn't grow old and which really still is me and with which I'm in contact and which this is a sort of in love, one of the most truthful sort of guides that I have mm -hmm. and that the whole process really, I think T.S. Eliot uh, put on it, the whole life is a journey back to the place where you started from and recognizing it as home for the first time. And as if one's whole life, and I feel this very, very strongly, is to find one's way back to join what one was consciously, to jo unconsciously, to, to, to join it with all one's awareness mm -hmm. and be with it in a greater way than one was before one started. But there was a sense in all the cultures, and there still is in India, of each stage of one's life having a different purpose, a different function, and um, a stage in one's life which is almost like a preparation for death. Do you accept that or, or not? Uh, well, uh, I don't know, um, uh, because death is not the end. So I don't know if it's a preparation for that. I, I didn't, but I do believe profoundly that one's life is seasonal and that the whole of the universe is seasonal and that there are these seasons that one lives one's way through. But I don't have a feeling at all that the end is the end mm -hmm. and that birth was, I don't feel that really birth was my beginning. Birth was merely a door an entrance, and death is an exit. But I think uh, uh, that as one experiences things, there's a sense of timelessness, of something which is beyond end and beginning. This I feel, mm -hmm. feel very strongly. I don't feel that, that, uh, that, 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 this is, uh, that it's an end. It also is a preparation, that this is a preparation. What for? What for? I don't know. And I'm not really even interested, because that is something which is not in my hands. The, 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 the great thing is to choose between truth and error now. Mm -hmm. And I feel to the extent to which one lives one's own truth, to that extent, one is prepared for what is to follow. Are you curious about death? No. No, not really. Mm -hmm. I've been so near it. I've lived so long with it. Um, uh, 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 and I've seen so many people die in all sorts of extraordinary ways. Because I lived for a period myself when I was under sentence of death. And when I was being taken out and told that I was being executed and had to watch other people die. I've seen people of all races, of all cultures and conditions die. I've seen people who were very dear and near to me and have been with them in their death. And it's been extraordinary to me that how when the moment of dying comes, how all that has been provided for inside the human spirit. And something comes and takes over and a certain majesty and dignity mm -hmm. comes in to take people on at the end. And I've seen, I think, of an old lady I was with for three weeks, right up to the end I was with her to her death. And who told me, uh, I think one of the dreams, that was perhaps a dream which was nearest to her death. She'd been very ill all her life. And she was a marvelously brave, suffering human being, was never embittered by her illness. And she woke up just before she died and she said, I had the most wonderful, wonderful dream. I saw all my beds of illness and sickness and suffering gathered together 
into a bed of roses. Mm. And the roses were flowering and they were red. And then she died. And I always felt that this was not an end, that it was not a cutting off, but that she seemed to me to grow into death, that it was a process of growth. But I don't, I've always had very great respect for the natural frontiers of human awareness. Mm -hmm. I've never tried to, myself, to go beyond them. I feel that, you know, that what I have to work on is enough, mm -hmm. and that there are sort of walls. The only thing is that these walls are not opaque. I'm aware, in fact, there's a strange kind of light comes through them. But what is most interesting of all is that things are lobbed over this wall, come from the other side, that come into one's life, like coincidences that we've talked about, and all sorts of other strange phenomena. Like uh, the phenomenon of what happened when Jung died. Isn't that something well, that falling was one, over the wall? This is, this is one of the things that was lobbed over the walls. Uh, you do you do know the story of what, what I'd happened? I'd love to hear you say it. I've only read it. It's well, it was... Uh, um, I hadn't for weeks even given Jung a thought. I'd been in southern Africa, and I was extremely perturbed by what was happening in my native country. I, I found it very hateful, what was happening, and I couldn't see, really, the way out of it. And I came back to Europe with a sense of disaster impending in a ship. And I was so perturbed by that, I couldn't sleep for several days. I tried sleeping drafts, I tried everything, I couldn't sleep. And then one afternoon, I'd been reading, trying to read a book on Dante in this ship. And I was lying there and gradually I found there was something trying to come to me and then suddenly I had a vision of myself being deep in the mountains of Switzerland, in a very deep, dark valley, and all sorts of avalanches were building up. And that it was so dangerous, as they say in avalanche country, that even if you raise your voice too high, you can precipitate an avalanche. And I was very, very quiet. Then at the far end of the valley, on top of a mountain, on which there was a bit of sunlight falling, I suddenly saw Jung, whom I hadn't given a thought to. And he stood there on the mountain, and he looked at me, and he waved his hand, he always, in a way which he always did when he saw me off through the garden of his house. And he said in that sort of strange schoolboy of his English, he said, I'll be seeing you. And he vanished down the valley. And with that, an extraordinary feeling of peace came over me, and I fell asleep. And I slept for a long time until the next morning my steward came to me to bring me my tea. And I got up and I remember looking through the porthole of the ship and an albatross, rather like a sort of cold, rich, ancient mariner albatross came sailing by and sort of looked in at me in a very strange way in the port. And I felt very odd about this. And I went back to my bed and I took my tea and my fruit and I found also the steward had put the ship's news bulletin on my side, and I opened it. And the first thing I saw was that uh, Jung, the distinguished Swiss psychology, had died in his home in Kisnacht in Zurich last night. And comparing the latitude and longitude and the difference in time we were, that this vision that I had, which I thought came out of myself, coincided exactly with the moment of his death. Mm. Now that is, uh, as I say, what I call by something lobbed over from the other side. But it was this very strange comfort I got from this, I'll be seeing you. What is um, another coincidence is that um, a couple of days ago, coming in a taxi with the producer of the program, we were talking about this story, which had had a tremendous effect on him. And the, the taxi driver suddenly, after the story had been told, turned to us and said, I'm sorry, I've been eavesdropping. And that story meant so much to me because 18 years ago, I was driving somewhere in the country and suddenly I saw two great eyes staring at me from the road. And I had a tremendous sense of something wrong with my father. And I stopped the car and I called. And my mother said, well, Thank God you called, because your father is very ill. 
and I drove straight home, he said. And in fact, when I had called, my father had already died, but oh, the mother didn't want to tell him on the telephone. And the extraordinary thing was that this man had not talked about that to anyone for 18 years. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier about the common experiences we all have, which go so much beyond our minds and anything we can understand, and yet our fear about discussing them, as though somehow we'd be branded as mystics or strange. Yes, uh, oh, this is, uh, I, uh, how wonderful that story is because, that you've just told me, because I think it, it establishes, it's another confirmation of what I have felt about life is that you know, everywhere, human beings, uh, they know so much more than they allow themselves to know. Mm -hmm. And it's because all sorts of experts, these, as I say, these rationalists who've come to dominate modern awareness, this kind of shallow, mistaken, so-called applied scientific rationalism, which make mocks this and makes fun of it and dismisses it as superstition, that uh, they've discredited this thing in human beings. There's a much more of it. It exists on a vast scale. And if we can unlock it, we will transform the world.